So, hi, my name is Alicia, uh, 32 years old from uh, New Jersey, South New Jersey. Um, I am a kindergarten teacher. I work as a teacher in Philadelphia, um, and I really enjoy that. In my free time, I just like to do photography, be with friends and family, um, enjoy getting ice cream, <laughs> um, enjoying the summer. So, you know, going to the beach or like, um, just things like that, the simple things. So it all started during like my second year of teaching. Um, I didn't really start getting symptoms or experiencing symptoms until um, around like November of, uh, I would say 2021. Um, so my main symptom was like fatigue. So I would get like really tired. Um, and then I also noticed me getting a little bit of shortness of breath. Um, so um, at my school, we would have to like take the stairs um, to go up. Uh, so usually going up the stairs, I'm like, yeah, this is great. This is exercise. But then after a while, I'm like, why do I feel like I'm getting winded <laughs> after only like the second um, uh, staircase? Um, but I just didn't think anything of it. I was like, maybe I just need to exercise more. Um, so those were like my two main symptoms that I started to experience. Um, and I just kind of like brushed it off. Like, you know, I'm being stressed, I'm uh, working, I'm tired, <laughs> I'm not exercising enough. So maybe that's why I'm getting shortness of breath. Um and, you know, just being uh, an anxious person, you know, experiencing panic attacks, feeling like chest pains, maybe it's COVID. So that's what I was experiencing all of um, uh, that year. And it was just like unexplainable things. Um, and it started to just gradually increase um, as the year went by. So during the summer, I found myself, or like springtime into summer, I found myself taking naps because I was a person that never did naps, <laughs> but I did naps and the naps would take like four hours. And even my family is just like, this is odd. Are you okay? <laughs> and I'm just like, I think I'm just really tired Um, to the point where it's just like, I would have a good rest. I would have good sleep, eight hours, wake up. And like, I just remember being like in a church service and I'm dozing off. I'm like, oh my gosh, what has happened to me? <laughs> um, so, but it wasn't until July of 2022, I started getting like moon face swelling in my uh, throat and in my face. Um, it started in my eyes, but then it got even worse. And to the point where I couldn't swallow. And I'm like, okay, this is, this isn't good. <laughs> All this time, I'm thinking maybe it's allergies. But now that like, I can't swallow, I need to go to my doctors. Um, so yeah, those were like, all my symptoms, especially like having night sweats and everything. Yeah. Just waking up and, you know, having to change like my bed sheets and my um, pajamas. It's just like, this is very odd, but you know, it's like springtime, summer. So it's like in the eighties. So I'm like, it's really hot. <laughs> I just honestly maybe thought it was allergies and crazy enough when that initially happened, when I couldn't swallow, I unfortunately still went to work. <laughs> uh, confessions of a workaholic. <laughs> so, you know, um, my principal and coworker were like, you know, please go see your doctor. And so I did. I left work and they took me, my doctor, primary doctor took me in right away and she did not like what she saw. So um, she ordered like stat CAT scans of like like my neck and everything. Um, and she's like, in the meantime, I'm going to order you like an EpiPen <laughs> or anything. She's like, change your sheets if it is allergies. Cause she's like, we don't know what this is, but let's take all the necessary precautions. 
everything just happened so quickly. So after that initial CAT scan that um, my doctor ordered, I did it right away and she got the results back within like, like fairly quickly. And she told me like, hey, there's like some type of like mass in your chest. I want you to go to the ER. And I'm just like, mass, oh my goodness. But I wasn't, I think I was still hopeful. It's like, maybe it's just like a cyst or something. I don't know. <laughs> you don't want to think anything so bad. Um, so, you know, just went to the ER, you know, constant communication with my family, letting them know what's happening. And, you know, I got there like around four. So um, four into like the night, I had another CAT scan. Um and then they did biopsy, bone marrow biopsy, um, doctors, fellows constantly coming to me like, hey, this is much, mostly like likely a tumor and the size of it is just like crazy big. Um, so those were a good amount of tests that I've had during that initial diagnosis. My diagnosis came back as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, diffuse large B cell, um, and my subtype was primary metastinal uh, B cell lymphoma. Um, and you know, diagnosed August twenty fifth, twenty twenty two. So, a uh, size of ten centimeter size tumor <laughs> in my chest. It was just a sigh of relief like literally a sigh of relief, like I wasn't crazy because like, like I said, all that school year, I thought so I knew something was wrong with me, but I just couldn't pinpoint what it was. Like, you know, you know, having anxiety, these panic attacks, being so tired. I'm just like, maybe blaming everything on work, but I just knew my body was off and just, I felt like I couldn't explain anything that was like happening to me. All I could knew was what I was feeling. So it was, you know, scary, but honestly it was just a sigh of relief. Like, okay, there's finally an answer and I'm seriously not crazy. I was on the regular med surge floor, um, had the oncology team come to me. They're like, hey, you're here, but this is the plan. We're gonna move you to the oncology department and then we're gonna lay everything out. We're gonna start treatment right away. So they did that quickly. And then um, they came to me, had all the paperwork <laughs> and uh, explanation and information of the type of treatment that they're gonna start me on so you know they just start first started off like you know again this is the type of cancer that you have um and this is the type of treatment that will work well for you and because of the cancer um so I was started on dose adjusted epoch um so what it looked like was I would have to have treatment every three weeks um, five days inpatient, um, and it'll be continuously running uh, for the 96 hours. So it was very, very, you know, intense uh, treatment and followed by a uh, rituximab outpatient. My side effects were definitely nauseousness, um, you know, hair loss, of course, always a side effect. Um, fatigue, extreme fatigue. Um, and then I did have, you know, a short time of having problems with edema. Um, so, but then we figured out what was happening. It was part of like the prednisone treatment. So they had to cut back because I would swell a lot in my arms and in my face, which was causing problems. <laughs> you know, for me, uh, my hair was part of like my identity. Um, I have had very big hair. <laughs> I was, 
usually known for my hair. Um, I loved doing my hair. Uh, I always had braids or like kinky twists in my hair, different styles. Um, and, you know, losing my hair was just very traumatizing. Um, I didn't think it would happen so quick. Um, it was after like my first treatment. Uh, I had braids in, so I was planning on doing like last one hurrah <laughs> hairstyle. Um, but, you know, my mom was helping me and she just unfortunately was just trying to tell me like, you know, I don't know if this is going to work out. There's like chunks coming out, you know, but, you know, we can keep trying and it didn't work out. Like, it's okay to grieve. You can grieve however long it needs to take because it was literally like a part of you. It's something that made you who you are or who you were. Um, and, but there can be like new beauty in it and a new level of trying to learn how to like love yourself, however you may look like. Um, and knowing that you're, you are still you, but you're becoming someone better. The mental aspect was like also hard um, because cancer in general is just a traumatic experience. And um, let alone being in the hospital, you know, for five days, <laughs> um, just sitting in the room, um, you know, I did make it a point to like, just take laps around uh, the nurse's station. Um, you know, I would bring things that I would try to do that would help me feel better, like um, bringing my Bible or, you know, people bring me my uh, coloring books and coloring crayons, um, like my video game systems, uh, books, anything that could like help with, you know, dealing in that space for a long period of time. Um, but I'm not gonna like dismiss the fact that it was like really hard. There are times where it's just like the lack of motivation of just wanting to participate in any of the things I had like reading or anything because the focus wasn't there or um, sometimes it just did feel lonely. Um, but I did have and I still do have an amazing support. Um, you know, my mom was has been with me uh, throughout like my treatments. My brothers will make it a point to like visit me. I would have friends visit me and keep in touch with me. It was just those things that like helped me get through it. The mental aspect was definitely hard because time kind of like stops when you know like life is still moving for like your friends and family <laughs> um so that was just hard it's just like you know you're getting treatment and it's like you kind of have to stop your life just to undergo treatment um so but you know <laughs> come out of it and just picking up where i left off um so i finished treatment uh the week of uh, Christmas and I took off for about two and a half months um, and I went back to work uh, the end of March um, which was good for me um, I wasn't sure how long I should wait to go back to work um, but I figured around that time would be good because it would only be a short amount of time before summer break. After treatment, my doctor wanted uh, to wait just a few weeks for the, the treatment to, as she says, marinate <laughs> within my body um, to get its last work in before uh, my PET scan. Um, so it was about like two, three weeks out before I had my PET scan. Um, <clears throat> and then 
uh, it was a week in between when I saw my doctor. Um, so about three weeks, I had my PET scan. And then a week, I um, saw my doctor that I was well, that the tumor had shrunk significantly to the point where it's just like, she said, I'm, I'm no evidence of disease. So I was good to go. She's like, I will not see you again until <laughs> your next checkup, which was nice. It was just a fresh of breath air. It's just like, I don't have to deal with this anymore. No more. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, just especially kind of going through, I mean, the treatment, everything, and then hearing those words, I mean, that's incredible. So how frequently do you have scans right now? So the next scan, unless my doctor says anything else, <laughs> will be, you know, six months out. This anxiety is so real. It's just the, the thought of what if and... I definitely don't want to think that way, but it's just that natural, normal thought and feeling. So I just, I mean, I just pray. I just take breathing <laughs> techniques um, <clears throat> and just try to think of the positives instead of the negatives. Or think more positive than the negatives because I'm still gonna, I'm still gonna think negative negatively. Unfortunately, something that I'm gonna have to endure until something <laughs> or just lifelong. So it's just gonna be a constant battle of just like stress and yeah, PTSD. But knowing that I'm good and continuing to believe that like I'm good. The journey is definitely a hard one. And I just don't want anyone to feel dismissed of their emotions or their thoughts. Their emotions and thoughts are valid. And, you know, you are able and to ex just express the way that you need to express yourself. So if, like, you need to get angry, get angry, get sad, feel all those emotions um, and then to also, you know, find community, um, community can be hard sometimes, but, um, there is an amazing, uh, community within, uh, the cancer, cancer support groups, um, a big support group, um, online, like Facebook and Instagram, you know, I definitely found those and they have been like definitely helpful throughout the journey. Um, just family and friends um, and just being real with them. It's okay to be real with your loved ones and letting them know that they will and will never understand, but for them to know how you're feeling and just to give them a chance to just hear you and to try to be in your shoes. Um. So yeah, just don't give up, you know, continue to believe and hang on to hope and and then also be an advocate for yourself. So that was, you know, one of the things. And it was just helpful that my medical team said, please ask questions and knowing that they will sit there with me to answer all those questions, you know, felt at ease. Um, and I know not everybody ha will get that opportunity or have that type of medical team that will like sit with you, but it's just like, you know, no, this is my body. This is what I'm experiencing. And if you're going to be my medical team, I want you to answer my questions. I want you to help me understand so that this journey can be easier. Don't be nervous or feel like you're bothering your medical team just like be on them <laughs> take every notes that the doctor says ask if it's okay to record them 
um, what they're saying to you, ask if there's any other options. Yes, so definitely feel your feelings, take hold of your thoughts, find support groups, whether it's family, friends, or community online, and definitely be an advocate for yourself because you you need you. 